you. I'm going to um, continue Larissa's theme of aliens, and I'm also going to start by making life very difficult for myself by using a quote from quantum mechanics. <laughs> uh, prediction is difficult, especially about the future. Now this quote is attributed to Nels Bohr, and he wasn't joking when he made the quote. He was absolutely serious, because if you're talking about Schrodinger's cat and the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, that's a literal statement. But of course, taken out of context, it's got, you know, um, the wit of, say, a Woody Allen quote. And so it went viral long before the word viral took the meaning that it takes today. Um, so prediction and future change. That's what I'm going to talk about today. And I'm going to make the rather unorthodox suggestion that the very, very deep history, the very, very deep past of life on Earth has extreme relevance to um, the near future, the very near future. And by the deep past of life on Earth, I don't just mean human history a few thousand years ago or even human prehistory a few million years ago. I'm talking about events 65 million years ago or 550 million years ago. Um, time scales that are immeasurably incomprehensible to most of us in this audience. Um, to make them a bit more comprehensible, I'm going to use a metaphor that was um, a favorite of the late great evolutionary biologist Stephen Jay Gould. And he said, let's compress the history of the Earth into a yard. And the yard was very modestly defined by King Henry I as the distance from his nose to the tip of his finger. So let's take that rather antiquated definition of the yard as our um, literal, literally our yardstick for the history of life on Earth. So my nose is the beginning of planet Earth. It's 4,500 million years old. Life begins somewhere at my shoulder about 3,500 million years ago. And for the entirety of my arm, life exists at the microbial level. There are no animals we can see with the naked eye. At my wrist, about 550 million years ago, it suddenly goes berserk, and every single animal group that's alive today evolves in the blink of an eye. That's the Cambrian explosion, and that's the first event which I'm going to talk about. Dinosaurs first appear in the palm of my hand about 230 million years ago, and they go extinct somewhere along my finger about 65 million years ago. That's the second event which I'll talk about, the dinosaur extinctions and the post-dinosaur extinction mammal diversifications. And all of humanity is restricted to the extreme edge of my fingernail, and a, ju a judicious stroke of a nail file can basically erase us from this yardstick. So we're talking about immeasurably kind of old um, events. So let's, without further ado, go straight back to the first event I'll talk about, the Cambrian explosion. Oops. There we go, the Cambrian explosion. So as I said, this happened on my wrist about 550 million years ago. And for 3,000 million years before that, Nothing happened with life, basically. It existed at the microbial stage. But in the blink of an eye, geologically speaking, in about a few million years, every major animal group that's alive today evolved. So you had um, jellyfish and um, scorpions and dragonflies and echinoderms, starfishes and sea urchins. You even had the very primitive relatives of vertebrates, backboned animals, little tiny fish were swimming around very soon after animals first evolved. Basically, evolution went berserk. To give you an idea of just how rapidly evolution proceeded, that on your left there is the eye of a fly that buzzes around on Kangaroo Island today. It's a living animal. It was living until we pinned it out and <laughs> photographed it. Um, the image you see on the right is the eye from a crustacean-like animal that we dug up on Kangaroo Island a few years ago that's over 500 million years old. It's over half a billion years old. And that animal already had an eye as acute and as functionally kind of um, adept as the eye of a living fly. So within the space of a few million years, evolution went from having um, no eyes, um, no animals in fact, to extra extraordinarily refined, well-adapted, advanced animals. Now, what caused this frenzy of evolution, this 
cascade of you know, rapid evolutionary change. Um, I think it's all got to do with positive feedbacks, a thing that uh, biologists call correlated progression. Every evolutionary change generates a, um, a cascade of further changes which feed back and help amplify the first change. As an example, to take the evolution of an eye, imagine a, a blind crustacean like crab-like animal scuttling about the ocean floor. It doesn't really see where it's going. It somehow manages to find food, maybe through smell or touch. It suddenly evolves some ability to see. It doesn't have to be a fully formed eye, but some light perception, some movement perception. Suddenly it can see what it, where it's going. Its prey had better work, uh, watch out. Its prey needs to now adapt evolve faster legs or camouflage or something. This in turn is going to create pressure on the original predator to refine its eye, to refine its other adaptations. So every single adaptation can, will, can and will trigger a cascade of further adaptations that will feed back and help um, increase and force the speed of evolution of the ad original adaptation to increase. Okay, so let's fast forward now, and I really mean fast forward, to um, 65 million years ago, to um, the middle of my um, middle finger. That's when the dinosaurs went extinct. Essentially, a, um, a meteorite 10 kilometers wide hit the Earth, um, somewhere where um, modern Mexico is, um, blew a hole, blew a crater the size of Tasmania threw up a dust cloud that blocked out the sun for months, maybe even years, and wiped out 90% of life on Earth, including all the dinosaurs, except for a few feathered flying ones, which are still around today. We know them as birds. Most placental mammals, our ancestors, most of those animals also perished in this catastrophe. But a few lineages survived, maybe only one lineage. And all the survivors were tiny little mouse-like things. Yet, within a couple of million years of this catastrophe, the bulk of modern mammal diversity had already evolved to replace the dinosaurs. So on, in the air you had bats, on the ground you had um, ungulates, lions, tigers, um, armadillos, porcupines, uh, moles burrowing underground, rabbits, rodents, in the trees you had primates. Um, the whole pan poly of um, mammal diversity evolved very rapidly within the space of a few million years. Um, and again, just one example of how quickly evolution proceeded. Um, the meteorite hit about 65, 66 million years ago. 64 million years ago, we already know that there was a primate in the trees. This is Purgatorius, the world's first primate. They've recently described its legs and arms and it had adaptations for climbing. So we know that evolution if there's a niche, evolution finds a way, and finds a way to fill it very fast. So what drove this frenzy of evolution in mammals, apart from just ecological opportunity? Again, I think it's all to do with um, positive feedbacks and correlated progression. For instance, to um, take up the vision theme again, um, imagine the primate ancestor developing slightly better binocular vision to allow it to scuttle up trees. Suddenly, it's in a very complex three-dimensional environment. The pressure to develop more refined eyesight and more refined neurology and musculature to cope with that environment is going to be immense. So that's all going to feed back and help it um, and form the selective context for it to actually develop even further, um, for it to even further improve its eyesight and its climbing adaptations and everything else. So again, you've got a perfect positive feedback loop that um, is really going to cause evolutionary speed to take off. Now, um, armed with this knowledge of um, these two events in the, um, the dim geological past, let's go back to the present, to the tip of my fingernail, before the nail file arrives. Um, the world as we know it, and as many people today have said, is changing at the most rapid rate in history. I mean, um, to really illustrate that, imagine taking a, um, a, a caveman or cavewoman and transplanting him or her 10,000 years or 100,000 years into his or her past or future. That person wouldn't know the difference. Nothing would have changed. For about 2 million years, humans used very similar stone tools. We barely changed. But take the average teenager and put them back 30 years, or take yourself and put yourself forward 30 years, and you would be a fish out of water. 
the world is changing much more rapidly than it has been in history, and that rate of change is, is increasing. And this isn't just a gripe from a technophobic academic um, who's annoyed that his three-year-old daughter can use an iPhone and he can't. I mean, my phone's so old, I, I'm on the bus, I get a phone call, I answer the phone, people laugh. Um, but anyway, um, the world is changing at an ever-increasing pace. But that's my subjective view, but I, so I tried to make it objective. I tried to quantify it. I went to the internet. I didn't go to Wikipedia, Chris Kirsten. <laughs> but I went to a website that seemed to be respectable. I mean, it's got org in the title and it's got, got UK in the title, so it's got to be accurate. Anyway, I went, to a, I went to a timeline of modern inventions and I plotted the, accumula the accumulation of technological kind of like innovation in human society. And you can do that yourself with any timeline. I just picked one. You'll get the same pattern. So with the timeline I picked, um, at 2400 BC, the first invention on that timeline appears. That's the abacus. So human technology goes from zero to one at 2400 BC, right? The mechanical clock appears at about 600 BC. So therefore, human technology increases by another notch. You can see that not very much happens until about 1400, and then it all goes berserk. Between 1400 and 1600, there were 12 game-changing inventions that occurred in human technology. In innovations that fundamentally um, changed the quality of human life and the human existence. Though th that was more than had occurred in the entirety of um, human history up to that point. And um, about half of those were due to one person, Leonardo. So <laughs> He can take a lot of credit. I mean, he invented, amongst other things, the ball bearing, for instance, and the first mechanical calculator. I never knew that. Um, now, fast forward to the next 200-year interval, between 1600 and 1800. There were 21 game-changing inventions, again, more than the entire history of humans up to that point. And in the final double century that I can analyze, between 1800 and 2000, there were 75 game-changing inventions that changed society. Again, more than in the entire, in the entire, more than the entirety of human history up to that point in time. So, if you extrapolate, in the next 200 years, there will probably be another hundred or so game-changing innovations that are fundamentally going to change the way we live. And um, that's my prediction, and it's a safe prediction because I know I can't be proved wrong in my lifetime, unless one of those, unless one of those inventions is immortality. Nevertheless. Um, it's pretty clear that the speed of technological change, um, we are on a technological curve that's going to increase with speed and there's no signs of diminishing. It might diminish at some distant point in the future when all the possibilities are exhausted. But if you look at the way it's going now, that point is so far away that it might as well not exist. And what it does mean, though, is that the way we live is going to be unrecognizable, maybe even 50 years from now, right? Um, a few thousand years ago, society was completely different to society today. A few thousand years hence, it will be completely different again. I would say that our technological window, our age, will probably last only about a century, from about 1950 to 2050. And archaeologists in the future and paleontologists in the very distant future are going to dig through the rubble and they're going to find our digital detritus. They're going to find our iPads and our Atari video games and our iPhones and their Apple computers. And they will actually realize this is an age. We live in an age. And they're going to, just like we call the old stone age, the Paleolithic age, when people first discovered stone tools but hadn't perfected them, they're probably going to call our age the Paleo-Digital age, when people had discovered digital technology but didn't really know how to use it yet. And now, what about life on other planets? We don't know about life on other planets, but the null hypothesis is that it will probably follow the same trajectory as life on Earth. So technology in other planets will be stuck at zero for an infinitely long period of time. But once it hits this technological growth curve, it will accelerate and keep accelerating so it never stays at the same level for more than a few decades. And what does this mean for alien encounters? To get back to the alien versus predator theme. 
it's highly unlikely if we ever meet any alien society that we're going to be anywhere near the same technological level because once you start um, ascending this technological curve and inventions basically feed upon inventions and ingenuity feeds upon ingenuity, um, you're never going to stay at the same level for more than a, a few decades. So the chances of meeting aliens at our technological level are, in, are basically zero. So if you're actually going to travel to another planet, um, the chances are that um, it's not going to be, and you, and you find aliens, the chances are it's not going to be a very rewarding meeting. Either you're going to be trying to shake hands with bacteria, and Alan will know all about that, or the aliens are going to be so advanced that we're going to be the bacteria. Either way, it's not going to be a very rewarding meeting. So for, um, <laughs> for all the futurists out there, um, the view from paleontology has a few messages. The first message is, is about technological change, and that message is you won't see nothing yet. The second message is about meeting aliens, and there's two possibility, possible messages there. Um, be afraid or be very bored. <laughs> and the final message is, um, that we live in a re we will live in an age that's retrospectively recognised as being totally unique. The age when humans first discovered digital technology, just like um, when humans first discovered fire or when humans first discovered um, stone tools. We live in a, in a unique age when humans first discovered digital technology and first started to exploit it, but didn't know how to use it at all. Enjoy your time in the paleo digital age and enjoy the remaining talks. Thank you.